It's a great pleasure to share my passion for AI and robotics with you. I'm going to be focusing on AI background. The 2018 AI update is the talk I'll give after this talk. So I want to make sure that all of you are aware of the counterpoint to uh, people talking about all the bad things that AI might do for us, that it might eat our lunch, that it might uh, take over the world. Uh, and it's true that there are downside risks associated with AI, but it's incredibly important to make sure that you know that the benefits are very concrete and with us today. So here's an example of the benefits. Uh, DeepMind just uh, published a study with the National Health Service in the UK that indicated that they are able to diagnose diabetic retinopathies and other diseases uh, of the eye with an expertise that equals ophthalmologists. My wife is an ophthalmologist. She studied for a very long time to get good at this. And already we are training AIs to outperform ophthalmologists, at least in diagnosis. She does surgery. They're not there yet. So one of the things that we want to do is to recognize that the reason we need augmentation in AI is because our mammalian brains have an architecture that's millions of years old, and the human brain hasn't had a major upgrade for 50,000 years. All of you are familiar with Echo, connected speakers like Echo and the Apple iPod and the Google device, the home device, are all devices that have AIs on them. And they are one of the most popular consumer electronics items now. I mean, it's just wildly popular. And yet they make big mistakes, and we have to correct for their mistakes. An example, um, I was at the dinner table of my 93-year-old mother uh, earlier this year, and there was a disagreement about the difference between a toddler and a child. And my nephew decided to ask Alexa, which of course is right next to the dining room table, Alexa, what's the difference between a child and a toddler? And Alexa said, a child is a human between two years of age and puberty, and a cobbler is a pie with fruit filling. <laughs> so AI is not just one thing, it's many different things. It's rules which tend to be brittle. We use them extensively in the first couple of decades of AIs, but they're human-crafted emulations of human expertise. Works well for structured problems, doesn't work well when the data are changing rapidly. We have predictive analytic statistics, but when you're predicting elections, for example, as Nate Silver did in 2016, your mileage may vary. And in deep learning, we have a technology that is emulating pattern recognition capabilities at human levels or beyond. And we can reinforce high levels of performance in deep learning using reinforcement learning, to reinforce an agent for a high score in an arbitrary task. We have shared cloud knowledge that allows agents to share knowledge with each other. Very different than sharing music. They can share skills and update each other's skills on the web. We have genetic and evolutionary algorithms that allow us to simulate evolution. We start out with very simple parts, say wires, and then we select the wire configuration as we mutate them into something that can have very high performance as an antenna. NASA Ames did this 10 years ago, even more than 10 years ago, and came out with human level and beyond competitive performance for antenna design. And we have adversarial generative networks that allow us to pit two neural networks against each other so that one of them generates fake audio or fake video, fake art, the other one detects it, they go back and forth and tune each other up so that you get better fakes and better detection. We have self-modeling and simulation so that robots, for example, can model their own performance. You can take a limb off and it can remodel how it does locomotion and then you can put the limb back on and it can remodel again how it gets around. 
And we have deep learning that allows us to maintain the coherence of information in a pattern recognition hierarchy. You can see here that we have neurons that can respond to simple shapes in the first layer if we're training it on animals, just edges and shapes. In the second layer, the neurons respond to more complex structures like a paw or a hind leg or a snout. And then at the nth layer, you can actually get differentiation uh, between different kinds of animals. If you put in a dog as an unlabeled image at the top, you can get out a differentiation between a dog and a wolf, except if the system's been trained with wolves that have snow in the background all the time, and then you show it a dog with snow in the background, the system may mistake the dog for a wolf because it's keying off of the snow, not the characteristics of the dog. So you have to watch how you train these systems. These systems are being powered by massive amounts of data, like the data provided by data miner, this company has been collecting, vacuuming up massive amounts of data on the web. They have over $130 million of investment. They are literally condensing data and squeezing it into vectors of information for people who subscribe to particular classes of information, medical data or weather data or news data or financial data. And then we have hardware that's accelerating AI. This is the Google TPU2 chip. This chip is blistering fast. It's not two apartment buildings on a board. We can zoom in over it. This system is 180 teraflops. A teraflop is 10 to the 12th floating point operations per second, and this system is screaming fast. And you can wire 64 of these boards together and get 10 to the 16th floating point operations per second, about the raw computing power of the human brain. But the caveat, not for $1,000. Here's the NVIDIA Volta, incredibly powerful, 120 teraflops, and cheap, ubiquitous, already in self-driving cars, already in Internet of Things applications designed to be low voltage, low cost, low power, and truly a distributed technology. If you don't have the bench strength to use AI at home, no problem. You can put up your problem and your data and some prize money and get Kaggle teams of data scientists to compete against each other. There might be 250 or 300 teams that will compete for the best solution to your problem. And if you say, yes, but we can't put our data out in public, no problem. You can use this company, Xperfy. You just put your problem out in public, and the data scientists at Xperfy will bid on the solution to your problem. You don't have to release the data. In the spirit of full disclosure, I'm an investor at Xperfy. People sometimes say, don't try this at home too dangerous. I'm encouraging you to try machine learning and AI at home. You can download TensorFlow, which is a machine learning library that Alphabet invested tens of millions of dollars in. You can download it right into your laptop. You can use K or Keras to make TensorFlow easier to use. Yes, it has deep learning and convolutional neural networks and lots of great algorithms. And if you don't have the chops to use it, no problem. You can invite a high school student to help you. There's no shame in doing that. It's perfectly OK. If you want to learn about AI, there are lots of great places to go. You can't get a deep coverage in a 20-minute talk, but you can get deep coverage on machine learning from any of these places, Coursera, edX, Udacity, Udemy, FastAI, Khan Academy, or lynda.com. Anyone recognize this famous painting? This is Olympia from Monet, and a deep learning algorithm that was trained on ImageNet, which has tens of thousands of images, confidently identified Olympia as what? A burrito. <laughs> yes, a member of a food group. And Trevor Paglin, a MacArthur Genius Award winner from 2017, 
pointed this out and said, look, you know, we have our picture taken in airports and all over London and all over the world, and we have AIs interpreting those images. What if they do as bad a job on those images as this deep learning system did on Olympia? That could be a big problem. So here's the take-home message. Make sure if your company is using AI to interpret data, that you don't have biased data, that you really set up committees to make sure that you're looking for bias in your data proactively. Another issue with machine learning is that it's not very good at explanation. And luckily, not so luckily, it's very deliberate, there is a program at DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, and this program is headed up by David Gunning, and David is working with a bunch of university teams to make explanation much better in machine learning systems, which tend to be a black box. So instead of getting an explanation on the recognition of a cat, this is a cat, not good enough. How about this is a cat and here's why I think it's a cat? Much better. Turns out to be a very complex problem. So we have AIs now that are expert at a lot of things that used to take really smart people to do. For example, Libratus is a poker playing system. It plays no limit Texas Hold'em poker, and it played against four world champions. It was built by Tomas Sandholm and his graduate student Norm Brown at Carnegie Mellon University. This system played 120,000 hands of poker, just to make sure the result was not a fluke. And it turns out that it won to the tune of 1.77 million in poker chips. Why does that matter to us? Because this system can deal with misinformation and bluffing and strategy. Those are all really useful skills if you want to do negotiation, for example. This is Demis Hassabis in a seminal video from 2013. This is a game player that is playing breakout from scratch. And after 120 minutes, you can see the mediocre human score. And this Atari game player is now going to up its game. After 240 minutes, it burrows up the left-hand side of the screen and plays from the backcourt where the game has no defenses. Look at the score. Yeah, so that was a real breakthrough in AI. Now, that same team was later bought by Google, and the DeepMind team decided to challenge the world champion in Go, Lee Sedol. Uh, this was in March of 2016, and AlphaGo beat Lee Sedol four games to one. And when the Chinese Go champion heard about that, he said, well, you know, you can beat a Korean world champion in Go, <laughs> but try beating a Chinese world champion in Go. We invented the game. So that's exactly what happened. <laughs> in May of 2017, AlphaGo beat Kijai three games to zero. And you might think, well, you know, okay, point made. No, the DeepMind folks decided to start from zero, just the rules of Go, and they invented AlphaGo Zero, and here it is, with no prior knowledge of the game, just the basic rules as input, and after three days, it achieves a Go skill level equal to Lee Sedol. And then after 21 days, it achieves a skill level equal to Kei Jai, the Chinese champion. And after 40 days, it achieves a skill level that is unsurpassed by any system that they tested it on. So you might say, well, that must mean that AI is a game-changing technology. And indeed it is, but it's much more than that. AI is altering the playing field that all of us are playing on. It's not just a cute metaphor. It is radically transforming the playing field. So I want to talk to you briefly about driving AI into mobile devices like robots. You're going to hear another talk on robots. But I just want to talk about the AI part of robotic devices. This is the DARPA 2015 grand challenge on trying to get valves opened and doors opened to simulate robot performance in the Fukushima power plant. You can see that these robots are having some problems with something that we take for granted, dealing with gravity. And a lot of smart teams work very hard 
at getting these robots to perform. Yikes. Yeah. So there's a dirty little secret that people love watching robots fail. It's just something about us. Yeah. But watch what happens one year later. We have a robot from Boston Dynamics. Look at the stability of bipedal locomotion. What happened here? Was it motors and sensors that changed? No, it was the AI control system that allowed for underactuated knees and legs so that it could adapt to the environment. Looking at, look at it adapting on snow, no less. Watch what happens when it loses its balance. You can bring up the audio a bit, please. Remarkably improved performance, don't you think? Yeah. And here we are at Boston Dynamics in 2017, just last year. We've lost the legs, or at least the feet, and now we have wheels. And this system, instead of being able to pick up 10 pounds, can pick up 100 pounds. And it's remarkably stable. Its control system is big. Look at how it leans into turns. Very graceful. Really amazingly graceful control system. And of course, if you put ice skates on it, it might compete on holiday on ice. Yeah, and we're also putting AIs into trucks. Here's a Volvo truck from Auto, and here's its maiden voyage, delivering an incredibly important product, beer, Budweiser beer. Yeah, and if you look carefully, you can see that that's the driver, but he's not behind the steering wheel. He's doing his machine learning homework in the back of the van there. And in a moment, you'll see that, yeah, there he is, studying hard but not driving, that's the AI driving. And it's really good on long haul trucking, not so good on inner city trucking. Need some help with that. We have robots in space powered by AIs uh, and, under the, and robots under the surface of ice sheets documenting glacial melting. There's a new journal called Science Robotics, which is all about the science underlying robotics. And here is a system where each of these leaves, these green triangular leaves, allow for locomotion. Those triangular leaves are 25 microns, or millionths of a meter. So really small robotics, and the big post that it's on is a human hair. It's from Cohen's lab at Cornell. Here's some examples of applied AI. AIs have been sponsored by companies and governments all over the world, and for good reason. I did a study of 360 innovative applications of AI that were documented at the Innovative Applications of AI conference. These are the patterns that they had in common. It's not just better, faster, cheaper. It's different. AI allows us to expand the range of the possible, to do things that we didn't know that we could do before. And you can do things in design, diagnosis, manufacturing and management, sales and configuration, and quality control. Across the board, you can get better performance if you use machine learning and AI. Here's an example. Here's Sentient. They evolved their hedge fund managers and their recommendation engines for e-commerce. This company, Lemonade, has been innovating in the insurance industry across the board, including adjudication of claims, something that the insurance companies thought absolutely required a human. And they allow customers to donate their underclaimed amount to charity. So they're teaming with their customers. This company, Collect AI, uses machine learning to gather the best practices of collection agents, human collection agents. And this company, Introspection, looks for weak signals of a lawsuit. Oftentimes, when you get angry emails, you can just throw them in the trash. Sometimes those angry emails do turn into lawsuits. Introspection tries to weed those out. 
Digital Reasoning is a company that used to do military and intelligence work only. They've moved into fintech to look for signs of insider trading. And here's a market map from CB Insights of AI in the fintech industry. And it's all over the fintech industry. And we could also look at a similar map in healthcare. The Watson Health Cloud is something that has collected a lot of different algorithms and different classes of data to try to do a better job with patient care. And I want to say openly that they've had challenges with this. I'll be talking about that in the update section. But what I can tell you here is that, as IBM says, these are early days for AI and healthcare. It, they are hard problems, and they're going to stick with it. They've invested billions. They've had a lot of rough edges so far, and they're going to keep going. So let's talk about managing the benefits and the risks very quickly. We've seen Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook having to answer to Congress about Facebook's use of AI technology. We know that there's lots of fake news out there, and there's a fake news challenge that was run about two years ago, and it's recently completed. There's going to be a new one, and it's all about using AI to detect fake news. We know that there will be impacts on labor, and you've heard a lot of optimism from Peter and other folks about uh, the effect of AI on jobs. I believe there'll be millions of new jobs, yes, but I also believe that AI and machine learning will displace a lot of jobs. And what matters is the ratio between those two things. And that ratio at any time could be unfavorable. It may ultimately be favorable. But this is a study done by the Oxford Martin Group. And it indicates that 47% up to 53% of US jobs over the next 10 to 20 years, not immediately, will be impacted by machine learning and automation, and it's even higher in other places. So what that says to me is, yes, AI and machine learning will improve productivity and precision of our work. It will transform business models, like that transformed landscape that I showed you. But that means, I think, that we're going to have to provide free, high-quality training. And for those people who can't get new jobs immediately, some form of universal basic income even if we try lots of different experiments doing it. I think that's better than, than the alternatives. If you have a better alternative, tell us about it. I think that AI and machine learning are not going to be sources of nirvana or gloom and doom. I invite you to the adult conversation that AI comes with trade-offs. Better, faster, cheaper, different problem solving, and also job disruption and human identity change and risk amplification and some risk reduction. You've heard Elon Musk worrying about the potential dangers of AI, but to his credit, he was with us in a conference in Puerto Rico on the future of AI and how to reduce the risk of AI. That was 2015. We talked about R&D on verification, validity, security, and control. And then a larger group got together at a Asilomar in January of 2017 to come up with the aspirational Asilomar principles. Here's some quick recommendations. Disrupt your own business with AI or others will. Plan for an increasingly capable set of voice interfaces. Rethink every aspect of your business processes. Don't just add AI to what you've got now. Democratize access to your business platforms. Open them up so other people can use them. Assemble data, algorithms, hardware, and talent. Talent is the hard part. And design for security, responsibility, and minimum bias. I'm encouraging you to build the future boldly and to do it responsibly. Thank you very much.